Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. Right. Tonight, we're going to pick up with our Revelation Study Foundation building in Zechariah 14.18. We closed off with 14.17, which we'll refer back to in a few minutes. We're going to finish Zechariah this evening, as, as we promised. And then we're also going to review the eight visions that are at the beginning of the book. Zechariah is foundational. I believe, to the study of the book of Revelation. There's just so much that we can only get out of this. These final verses in chapter 14, as an example, are the only area where any really detailed information is given about the thousand-year reign of Messiah in all of the Old Testament, just in these specific verses. So what's interesting here is that we have survivors from the war over Israel when the nations come up against her. And we have essentially a new Jerusalem. And we have really have a recreated earth, if, if you will, but not in toto. It's just that the Lord has moved back in and the boundaries between the earth, the world, and heavens are open for um, us to look at things times of the Gentiles will have been fulfilled by the time we reach the point of the scriptures that we're looking at this evening. So history, in a sense, as we know it, will have come to an end. History, as we know it, will basically have come to an end. And the people who populate the earth at this time uh, of this going on will be the survivors the survivors of the cleansing of the earth, the remnant that's left, the righteous remnant that's left, that have survived the great catastrophic events uh, that will have just occurred. And I believe what has to re be remembered is that these survivors are still unchanged. They've not yet received their immortal forever bodies that some will have received as this goes down. These we're talking about here are going to be those who have survived because they believe Yeshua is Messiah, but they're going to be the ones that will be like the half of the ten virgins that had no Holy Spirit that are talked about in the book of Matthew. We'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. So they're all human beings in exactly the same form that all of us sitting here tonight are still human beings. They will still face death uh, as a possibility because they're not yet in their eternal form. And they still have, unfortunately, because of being unchanged, they still have their fallen nature. And that has to do with a lot of what we're going to look at this evening. The only advantage here with those that still have their fallen nature is that Satan, Hasatan, has been locked up for the thousand years, so he's not there whacking on them all the time. And as we'll see when we get to Revelation, it talks quite a bit about Satan having been locked up for the thousand years. 
In um, verse 17 last week, we saw that one of the requirements for all of the nations on the earth at this time is going to be for that thousand year period that the pilgrimage feast of Sukkot must be kept. You etch that into our minds. The pilgrimage feast of Sukkot must be kept during that thousand years, that millennial reign. If the nations do not go up to Jerusalem, for Sukkot, each year during that thousand years, Adonai is going to turn their water off. Just that simple. No rain is going to fall on most of the world. There's actually two parts to this. No rain is going to fall on two, two parts of them. And, and this really, no rain is not an idle threat. No rain is not an idle threat. Consider the ramifications if it doesn't rain. If it doesn't rain, crops don't grow. If it doesn't rain, crops don't grow, people aren't fed. It really sets into motion a series of events that can bring economic chaos to that nation that gets no rain because that nation did not have its people come up to Jerusalem during the week of Sukkot. And the bottom line, of course, out of all this is famine, pestilence, and ultimately death. So at least on this issue, what man might not want to do during the thousand years should be governed by this threat. They will have to come up to Jerusalem annually at Sukkot. That's required. And to me, I wonder why so much of the body of Messiah totally ignores Sukkot, because it was totally in place until the time Yeshua came. And when he comes back, it's going to be totally in place, required, you got to do it. Yet most of the body today totally ignores it. It's like, woof, woof, woof. But they're not going to have a choice after Messiah returns. Now, consider that Adonai wouldn't have to do this if man still didn't have his fallen nature. If the surviving, most of the surviving population outside the land, now those inside the land living within the borders of Israel itself and within Jerusalem and in the temple area, are going to be people who will have received their eternal bodies. That area is going to be reserved for them I've, if we haven't gotten into that. If man still didn't have his fallen nature, man would be up in Jerusalem worshiping Adonai with all of his heart without this having to be prodded, going there really joyfully. Man's heart unfortunately, I believe, will stay essentially as it is. And there will be those that will jump at this, and there will be those that will go only because they have to. The Apostle Paul struggled with the way man's heart works. Do we remember him saying, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do? Yeah. So let's pick this back up again, Zechariah 14, verses... Um, 18 and 19, which reads, If the family of Egypt doesn't go up, if they refuse to come, they will have no annual overflow from the Nile. Ooh, there's a little addition to no rain. Moreover, there will be a plague with which Adonai will strike the nations that don't go up to keep the festival of Sukkot. That may well be the lack of rain. That may be the plague that's being repeated here. This will be Egypt's punishment and the punishment of all the nations that don't go up to keep the festival of Sukkot. And this really, this business of Egypt now with, with the Nile overflow completes the threat against those refusing to keep uh, Sukkot. Egypt is singled out. Notice that Egypt specifically mentioned uh, because they are a nation that this additional threat has to be done to because they aren't threatened by no rain. Egypt, as it exists and has existed all this time, is not threatened by no rain. They aren't dependent upon rain for water. They're dependent upon the Nile and the overflow of the Nile flooding their fields to bring in the necessary uh, water. They wouldn't be affected by the threat of no rain. What's no rain to an Egyptian? You know, think about it. One average summer in Florida is equivalent to 100 years of rain in Egypt. This is saying that no one will escape reprisal for disobedience 
if they disobey on keeping Sukkot in Jerusalem during the millennium, they will be punished. Plus, then there's this threat of plague mentioned here against the nations, and we talked a minute about that. Is that the lack of rain, or is that an additional plague? The Gentiles really have had their time of control on the earth. And I think you could say Adonai has not been pleased with them. Remember the plague back in verse 12? Well, that's brought against those who came up against Jerusalem. That's the nations that have come up against Jerusalem. And this is going to be fresh on their minds. So they will know that this plague business that they're being threatened with here for not going up to keep Sukkot isn't an idle threat. When Adonai says a plague will be brought against them for disobedience, I would think that this would be an extraordinary incentive to come up to Jerusalem to keep Sukkot. Keep Sukkot in obedience with Adonai's command. And again, why do they have to come up to Jerusalem once a year? Well, they're there not to keep Sukkot specifically. That's just a time delineated. They're there to worship the king. They're to come up with minimum once a year to worship the king, Messiah Yeshua. And that's the basis of all this. It's like all of these people today that can't come out and worship Adonai for any reason. They can't get to a synagogue and a church. They've got too many other things that are too important. There's the kids' soccer games. There's football. There's going to the beach. But when we get to the millennium, Adonai, Messiah, is going to be there and he's going to be ruling and everybody will go to Jerusalem every year on Sukkot to worship him. And that fact alone is more than just a reminder of the new era that the world is going to be actually in as this is going on. All right, Zechariah 14 and verse 20. When that day comes, this will be written on the bells worn by the horses, consecrated to Adonai. And the cooking pots in the house of Adonai will be as holy as the sprinkling bowls before the altar. Wow. What do these horses first mentioned here represent? They represent transportation. They represent transportation and their bells are on their say are going to say that they have been consecrated to Adonai. It's very interesting. The phrase holy to the Lord or consecrated to Adonai was what was engraved on a gold plate on the front of the high priest's turban that went into the to the temple. And he had to wear that when he went into the temple. It was an expression and a reminder that he was consecrated to God, that he was set apart to God, that he was holy to God. Say it any way you want to. Let's take this to Exodus 28, verse 36. It talks about this ornament on the priest's head. You are to make an ornament of pure gold and engrave on it as on a seal set apart to Adonai, or set apart for Adonai, fasten it to the turban with a blue cord on the front of the turban over Aaron's forehead, because Aaron bears the guilt of any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts. Now I'm going to pause there for just a second. Aaron bears the guilt of everybody as high priest by taking their consecrated holy gifts into the presence of Adonai, and this ornament is always to be on his forehead so that the gifts for Adonai that he's bringing in will be accepted by Adonai. This requirement is to tell the people of Israel what the high priest is all about, and it's to remind God that this particular man who wore this, the high priest, was holy, that is, set aside to Adonai. We should realize the special position the high priest had as he brought these gifts into the temple of God every year. 
he had to have special offerings laid out for him that set him aside so he could do this without coming into the presence of God, even though he was bringing all these gifts and offerings, and be killed because he was not in a condition that would allow him to come before God. Now, consider that this set apartness will be applied to all of Israel. This whole business of being set apart, like that high priest is set apart, is going to be applied to all of Israel. It's going to be applied to the pots that are cooking the sacrifices and they're going to be in the same venue at that point as the bowls that were used for the offering to carry the offering into the presence of Adonai and sprinkle it. Not exactly as in the case of the high priest, but very close. Israel in toto will also be set apart to Adonai. Exodus 19, 6, please. And you, speaking of Israel, you will be a kingdom of Kohanim for me. You will be a kingdom of priests for me, a nation set apart. These are the words that you are to speak to the people of Israel, that they will be a kingdom of priests for God, a nation set apart. Much like that high priest is set apart and has that emblem on his forehead that announces to everybody he is set apart he can come into the presence of God. You will be a kingdom of priests, a nation set apart. Take that to Jeremiah 2, please, verse 3. Israel is set aside for Adonai the first fruits of his harvest. In other words, when Messiah comes back and begins to set up his kingdom, Israel is going to be the very first thing that happens. They will be set aside. Israel is set aside for Adonai, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devour him will incur guilt. Evil, that's Israel. All who devour Israel will incur guilt. Evil will befall them. So there's all the nations now that have just come against Israel and created the situation with which Adonai came back. Now, an extension really of what we just, this is, is an extension really of what we just looked at in Zechariah 14, 20. Let's put that back up there. When that day comes, this will be written on the bells worn by the horses consecrated to Adonai, and the cooking pots in the house of Adonai will be as holy as the sprinkling bowls before the altar. See, the reason that these horses are consecrated to Adonai is so that they are totally set aside to Adonai. When this time becomes an actual reality on the earth, it will be like the type of earth that we live in now, where there's time and space, winter and summer, etc., except that we've been given an additional picture to look at here. Messiah will be ruling from the temple in Jerusalem. Hasatan will be in the pit. All will be required to come before Messiah each year at, at Sukkot and worship him. And the picture we need to see is what's written on the horse's bells. That's a picture for us, and it's important. It's like ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, pay attention. Adonai does not make what he has ordered difficult. He will not make getting to Jerusalem difficult. In fact, he will make it easy. Again, the horses represent a means of transport. The bells announce the means of transport will be available. The transportation will be consecrated to Adonai. I'm coming to believe that the transportation will be there just for the hopping on, which would make not coming up to Jerusalem to worship before the Redeemer on Sukkot, even more serious offense. A picture of rejection and rebellion if you didn't come to do that. See, among the things that Adonai is going to provide and make available for man to do is get there. You won't have to buy an airplane ticket. You won't have to save your money. It's going to be, I believe, 
that easy. A free trip. Here it says there are also the cooking pots in the house of Adonai will be as holy as the sprinkling bowls before the altar. Now think about this. Those sprinkling bowls carried the blood of the sacrifices to be sprinkled on the altar. And on Yom Kippur, the Ark of the Covenant. So let's look at, look at what's really said about these cooking pots in Ezekiel 46. Beginning in verse 21, he, that is the angel that's taking Ezekiel around th through the temple, understand that Ezekiel is now looking at a temple, not of his era, but of the coming era of Messiah ruling from Jerusalem. He took me into the outer courtyard and had me pass by the four corners of the courtyard, and there in each corner of the courtyard was another courtyard. And the four corners of the courtyard were enclosed courtyards, 70 feet long and 52 and a half feet. The four courtyards and the corners were the same size. There was a wall around each of the four with an open stoves at the bases of the walls. And finally, we get to what we want to look at. He said to me, these are the stoves where those serving in the house will boil the people's sacrifices. In other words, the sacrifices that the people are brought in are not simply going to be burnt offerings at this time, but they're also going to be prepared as food. Keep that in mind. This will be for cooking the meat that is intended for those worshipers who have brought this in to eat from their peace offerings. A shared meal with Adonai. A shared meal with Adonai. In other words, we're going to be able to sit down and have a meal with the returned Yeshua who is ruling, provided we meet all the criteria. Part will be burned, a fragrant aroma to Adonai. Part will be eaten by the worshiper, and part of this will be eaten by the priests and the Levites who are taking care that all of these things actually take place. This section of Ezekiel is no longer speaking of ancient Israel because Ezekiel 40 through 48 speaks to a temple that is yet to exist, the future temple that's coming. It's generally believed that this temple will exist during the millennial period in that Jerusalem that we're talking about in the future, consecrated to Adonai. In that temple, these cooking pots used to boil the people's sacrifices will be as holy as the sprinkling bowls before the altar that were used to sprinkle the sacrificial blood. That's pretty intense. So we're seeing now really a uniformity of consecration to Adonai taking place within Israel. But what we've looked at is just really the beginning. Check this out because it tells us that all of the cooking pots there and in Jerusalem and in all of Judah, that is, all of the land of Israel, will be also consecrated to Adonai. Let's look at Zechariah 14.21, please. It says, yes, every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be consecrated to Adonai Zavuot. Everyone who offers sacrifices will come, take them, and use them to stew the meat. When that day comes, there will no longer be merchants in the house of Adonai. Now, where'd that last sentence come from? Total change in the subject, but I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. The cooking pots in the temple will now be equal to the sprinkling bowls before the altar, and these cooking pots in the temple will be now no different than the cooking pots in every home that's in Judah and Jerusalem. What had been a sharp delineation between the sacred in the temple and the common outside the temple is gone as far as being within the land of Israel, which as I understand it will run at that point from the river Nile to the river Euphrates. What is in the temple, interestingly enough, is not in any form made common, which makes sense because this is to the Lord, but what is scattered throughout the land has now become consecrated. Everything in the land, in what we would call Israel, will be dedicated to Adonai, is what this, I believe, is showing us. Everything in the land 
in what we will call Israel will be dedicated to Adonai. And it seems to me fairly clear that the sacrifices will be offered in those days. It's talking about them. We'll get back there in a minute. Then there's that final statement in this passage. When that day comes, there will no longer be any merchants in the house of Adonai Zavot. Interestingly, the words translated merchant here, the word translated merchant here, as Ka'anei, or Canaanite. I think a lot's going on in the Hebrew here, but just stop and think about this. A Canaanite was a Gentile pagan. So this is telling us basically that there will be no Gentile pagans present in the future temple that Messiah will rule from. That's a 180 degree switch from today's Temple Mount, which is totally dominated by pagans worshiping their false god. But take that a step further. There will be no one there who, like a Gentile pagan, someone with no thought or fear of Adonai, who would seek really to turn a profit for themselves from what was being done on the Temple of Adonai Zavot. There will be no one there in the service of Adonai doing that. And there will be nobody there in the service of Adonai unless they belong to Adonai. Now, everything in everyday life, and we're just talking about Jerusalem and Judah here. We're not talking about the world. Everything in everyday life will be holy to Adonai within the confines of Israel. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic place to go and to live in. This prophecy throws a little different light on Yeshua cleaning out the temple courts in Matthew when he comes up to the temple that first time, doesn't it? Matthew 21, 10 through 13. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Who is this? They asked, and the crowds answered, This is Yeshua the prophet from Nazareth and the Galilee. Yeshua entered the temple grounds and drove out those who were doing business there, both the merchants and their customers. He upset the desks of the money changers and knocked over the benches of those who were selling pigeons. He said to them, It has been written. Ha! Huh. Yeah. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Well... Yeshua gave those watching him do this at his first coming a glimpse of the prophetic future when he comes back as king. There will be none of this going on in his temple. When Yeshua comes back to rule in that future temple, there will be none of this kind of practice going on. It's interesting that even though Yeshua came that first time as a suffering servant, on occasion he would give us just one of these little peeks about what it's going to be like when he came back. This is one of those. The Mount of Transfiguration, for an example, is another one. It shows us, tells us what it's going to be like, what he's going to look like. Now, class, I threw out a question for us to chew on last week. And it was a rhetorical question. I didn't want an answer. I still don't want an answer. I want it to be thought about. Some of you have nudged me about it a little bit. Some of you haven't. So let's talk about this. Here coming, we have a situation where Adonai Messiah is present in Jerusalem. He's going to be ruling with an iron staff. And the question is, can there be faith at that time as we know it? as we understand it. See, we have faith right now. But is it going to be the same then as it is now? Because understand, he's going to be there and observable. We have faith now that he will be. But we can't observe him. We have only the faith. As we understand faith, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. With Messiah there in person, won't that have some effect on people's faith as the way they look towards him? Will they have the same kind of faith that we do? So let me give you a little bit of thought to go with this. First of all, 
We are saved by grace through faith. Go to Ephesians 2, 8, please. For you have been delivered by grace through trusting, and even this is not your accomplishment, but God's gift. See, this is a basic premise. The operating element here is trusting, faith, that there is actually a Messiah. Our basic operating element is trusting in faith that there actually is a Messiah. He's been here and he's going to come back. And he's going to do what he's promised when he comes back. Faith by definition is really found in Hebrews, Messianic Jews 11.1, 1, please. Trusting is being confident of what we hope for, convinced about things we do not see. Interesting. Convinced about things we don't see. So what about when we actually see Messiah? How is this going to affect us? When Yeshua is back and when we actually see him, how is this going to affect us? Now consider this. Consider this. When Yeshua was here that first time, his Talmudim could see him, but they still had to believe. They still had to come into faith, even though they could see him, watching his miracles, watching everything going on. They still had to come to this point where they could actually believe in who it was. Thomas said, everybody remember Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Thomas says, unless I can see the nail marks in his hands, unless I can put my fingers where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. For those of you who've never read this, it's in John 21, 25. So, the question then becomes, what is the essence of faith? It's not just seeing Messiah, but being convinced about the things we do not see. I'll run that by you one more time. So what is the essence of faith? It's not just seeing Messiah, but being convinced of the things that we do not see. And understand there's going to be millions of people on the planet that are going to be aware that he's back, have seen him come back. These men and women will be living in a period with time and space just like we do now, but they will have the ability to also see into the spiritual realm because he'll be back in Jerusalem and ruling there along with those that have received their eternal bodies. They will have the ability to see into the spiritual realm the way that we would if we passed over into the spiritual realm today. But we can't. That's a gift that's coming. We would then be able to see him as he is and be like him. First John chapter 3. He will be here, Yeshua will be here with his people as he is, and they can see him. Consider this, that faith in Yeshua produces a relationship with the Father. Take this to John 14, verse 6. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice that the complete Jewish Bible places I am there in all capitals. What it's referring to here is when Moses approached God at the burning bush and God identified himself as I am. So here Yeshua has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We can take that back to the burning bush and preach on that for another week if you want to. So the basic problem of having a relationship with the Father is solved through Yeshua. No one comes to the Father except through Yeshua. John 17, please, verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who will trust in me because of their word. What is their word? I believe it's scripture. Trust in me because of their scripture. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are united with me and I with you, I pray that they may be united with us so that the world may believe that you sent me. This is really a priestly prayer by Yeshua, isn't it? A whole chapter is if you read through uh, John 17. This, this is that prayer where Yeshua speaks to his Father because his time is short on earth. It's, his time is drawing close. 
In a short time, he's going to be arrested, and effectively, he will be the sin sacrifice of the world. But note the relationships that he's talking about that are going to be put into place. I pray not only for these, but for those that will trust in me because of what's in their scripture, of what's in their scripture. He's praying for us at this point. He's praying for future believers that all may be one, just as you, Father, are united with me and I with you. I pray that they may be united with us. See the relationship? That's the relationship established. We are united with Yeshua and the Father through faith, through faith, by trusting. We're back to that. So that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, faith is also, faith also involves the hope of righteousness, being confident for most people, hope for righteousness is something that they would like to be confident for just like we are. Galatians 5.5 5. For it is by the power of the Spirit who works in us because we trust and are faithful that we confidently expect our hope of attaining righteousness to be fulfilled. Wow. For it is by the power of the Spirit who works in us because we trust and are faithful that we confidently expect our hope of attaining righteousness to be fulfilled. Take that to Titus 1.1 from Paul, God's slave and an emissary of Yeshua, the Messiah, sent to promote among God's chosen people the trust and knowledge of truth which lead to godliness and which is based on the certain hope of eternal life. God, who does not lie, promised that, that life. God, who does not lie, promised that life before the beginning of time. So here we have these people in the coming up millennium. People just like us, through faith, confidently hope for eternal life. See, nothing is essentially changed. They still seek a relationship with the Father through Yeshua. The sin nature of man still exists, even though Satan is locked up. So they still, through faith, will have the hope of righteousness before the Father. They will still have the hope of eternal life in the presence of Yeshua and the Father. They will be still looking towards their actual day of atonement. Their actual day of atonement really doesn't come until the end of the thousand years. They'll be still looking towards their actual day of atonement in faith, confident of what is hoped for. If seeing is believing, faith at that point should be increased a hundredfold as it was with Thomas, who upon Yeshua's appearing and his touching him said to him, My Lord, my God. Faith as we know it is still going to be required. They, those that are true, have a wonderful advantage during the time of the millennium of being able to go up to Jerusalem and worship him. They're going to come shouting in joy, no hesitation on their part. They're going to come because God says that you're to do this and he's made the transportation available for him to do it. Yet there is still the necessity of placing that threat over the nations. Why? Because of people. There are people who today believe Yeshua is Messiah but will not accept the filling of the Holy Spirit. There are people today that accept that Yeshua is Messiah and yet reject him for whatever reason. There's going to be the necessity of placing that threat over the nations of taking away their water if they don't come and worship him. Even with him there obvious and present. And my comment on that is go figure. Go figure. The hope of eternal life is really not completely realized by most of the world remaining population during the thousand-year period. 
I really believe we're down to that point. Death is a present reality to those that survive unchanged by the events that issue in the thousand year period and to those that are born of these survivors. Even though this period will be unlike any historical period since Adam. Look at, let's look at Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. This is telling us kind of how it's going to be then. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the calf, the young lion, and the fattened lamb together with the little child to lead them. Cow and bear will feed together, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox, an infant will play in a cobra's hole, a toddler put his hand in a viper's nest. They will not hurt or destroy anyone on my holy mountain, for the earth will be as full of the knowledge of Adonai as water covering the sea. Whoa. That's Isaiah 11. Let's take that to Isaiah 65, 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and take joy in my people. The sound of weeping will no longer be heard in it, no longer the sound of crying. No more will babies die in infancy. No more will old men die short of his days. He who dies at 100 will be thought young and at, and at less than 100 thought cursed. They will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and others live there. They will not plant and others eat. For the days of my people will be like the days of a tree, and my chosen will themselves enjoy the use of what they make. Whoa. This is not precluding death. It's just that those that die short of a hundred are going to be thought cursed. Yeah, there will be some people who will die and go to be with the Lord, but there's going to be some that are thought cursed. It's going to be a lot different than it is now. But why then, the question becomes, why then have this thousand-year period if not that much is being changed during that thousand-year period? Why have this time where there's still a very idolic period on earth and we still have men with their depraved nature here, still have death. Why have such a period of this? And the only answer I can come up with is this period is so that God's will and purpose as stated in Scripture can be fulfilled. It'll be as simple as that. Our ways are not as simple as His ways. We have to get over it and have faith that God knows what He's doing. His name will be glorified. His strength will be made perfect through his people Israel. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26. I will restore your judges as at first and your advisors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, faithful city. Zion will be redeemed by justice and those in her and those in her who repent by righteousness. Take that to Isaiah 62. Adonai has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Here your salvation, here your Yeshua is coming, here his reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. They will call them the holy people, the redeemed of Adonai. You, that's Jerusalem, will be called the Rusha, sought after, Irlo Neziva, city no longer abandoned. Tanakh is full of these kinds of statements. And these kinds of statements will be expressly fulfilled during that thousand year period. What God intended for his people Israel at the time he chose them. That's important. What God intended for his people Israel at the time he chose them and at the time he took them out of Egypt are going to be fulfilled during this thousand year period because they never have been. But it will still be fulfilled during this thousand year reign of Messiah. Remember Zechariah 8.23? And in it says, when that time comes, ten men will take hold, speaking all the languages of the nations, will grab hold the cloak of a Jew and say, we want to go with you because we have heard that God is with you. That statement right there 
is the original purpose that God always intended for his people Israel, that they should be the ones that ten Gentiles could grab hold of and go be with God through him. And God's purposes will be fulfilled during the millennium. Now one more thing before we review the eight visions that start Zechariah. Why will we still have animal sacrifices during this period? Why will we still have animal sacrifices during this period? It's clearly written that that's going to happen. It's there unless you want to spiritualize it or just ignore it. Some are going to say, well, animal sacrifices in ancient times were looking forward to Messiah. But now we're looking back at it, and that's a poor set of reasoning. Truth is, the only way to really, I believe, understand this is from a Jewish perspective. Why would God require animal sacrifices at this particular time? Well, first of all, not for salvation. Not for salvation. Let's look at Hebrews, Messianic Jews again, chapter 7. This is the kind of Kohen Gadol, high priest, that meets our need. Speaking of Yeshua. Holy, without evil, without stain, set apart from sinners and raised higher than the heavens. One who does not have the daily necessity, like the other high priests, of offering up sacrifices, first on their, for their own sins, and only then for those of the people, because he offered one sacrifice once and for all by offering up himself. So the sin sacrifice of Yeshua Messiah was once and for all. So we're back to our question. So why have sacrifices during his thousand year reign? Well, there's a concept that the Messianic community at large really doesn't have. And that concept is the requirement of ritual purity. The requirement of ritual purity in the place that God in his pure form, which will be the returning Messiah, will live. Here we have Adonai, Yeshua, living in Jerusalem. And everything is sacred there and throughout the land, down to the pots and pans, down to the bells on the horses. We've just looked at that. And all of these things are consecrated to Adonai, things that would have never been considered consecrated before. Ezekiel 45, 17, please. The prince's obligation, understand the prince here is Yeshua. The prince's obligation will be to present the burnt offerings, grain offerings and drink offerings at the feasts on Rosh Kodesh, on Shabbat, at all of the designated times of the house of Israel. That includes Sukkot. He is to prepare the sin offerings, the grain offerings, burnt offerings and peace offerings to make atonement to make atonement for the house of Israel. That's the speaking of the whole land of Israel. Now, why would the whole land of Israel need atonement if it's so widely set apart that it's totally different than all the world? Well, this is speaking of Messiah's activities in the Millennial Temple. He's the priest. Clearly speaks to a sin sacrifice, but we know that isn't for man's salvation. Yeshua has already done this. But the sin sacrifice is still required to make atonement for the house of Israel, for the nation of Israel. Why? Well, let's begin with the thought that that's dealing with the nation, not the individual. See, he's not making any atonement for individuals. He's making atonement for the set-aside land of Israel. But more than that, if everything in the land is holy, then what is going to happen when all of these millions coming up to Jerusalem each year at Sukkot take place? Because they still have their human nature, contamination. That will be the start of the millennium when this begins to happen. These, those that will be coming will be believers in Yeshua as Messiah. Believers in Yeshua as Messiah, but, underline but, 
these will have made be made up of that group that had no oil in their lamps. We're back to talking about the ten virgins of Matthew 25 that couldn't get into the wedding banquet. Yeshua said, I don't know who you are. And so they were excluded. These will still have their fallen nature. And so will require a sin offering if they're to come into the presence of Yeshua, Adonai, represented here as the prince. This is much the same as the sacrifice required for Aaron that enabled him to come into the presence of Adonai, except that this sacrifice that the prince is going to make will cover millions who will be coming up every year. The prince is the only one that can do this. The prince is Yeshua. He is the only one that's qualified to do this. The picture for us again is all obstacles being removed so that those required to come up to Yeshua's presence every Sukkot can do so. Their transportation assured. Their spiritual cleansing assured. Taken there is the fact this is the fallen nature of those coming each year will also be a contaminant to an Israel consecrated to Adonai and that cons contamination must be dealt with in order to maintain the purity of the land of Jerusalem and the temple. And it is prophesied that the prince will do just that. Hmm. New thought to ponder. Evidently, this sacrificial system is going to do that. Adonai is requiring sin sacrifice in his temple during the thousand years. In addition, the fellowship offerings, this we can understand. The sin offering kind of blows our minds off. Think, I think, this is me, I think it is for purity purposes, not an additional requirement for my salvation or anyone's salvation is for purity purposes. When we understand ritual purity, this is a holy God, Yeshua, living with men required to come to him that will have still have a fallen nature. And he will demand of them and provide for them ritual purity so that they can come into his presence. That's the only way I can explain this. You know, when the curtain in the temple was ripped in half, when Yeshua said, it is finished, and that allowed us access to God, it didn't allow us to just barge in any time we chose to. We still need ritual purity to physically approach God. And the ritual purity will not be over all of the earth, just in Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to do a quick review on the eight visions. This is not meant to teach these, but to jog our minds so that we remember how the Zechariah began, because those eight visions really lead up to what we've been looking at for the last few weeks. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8. The first vision had four horses, identified as being in a deep ravine and among myrtle trees. And the prominent horse was red or russet colored. The others were russet, chestnut, and white. And all the horses had riders. And the prominent horse had a rider described as a man. The others were just described as riders. And this man was later described as an angel or messenger of Adonai and their mission. Their mission, and we should pick this out, their mission... That first mission was gathering information on all of the people God had created and were living on a global basis. That was their purpose. Mission one. Their vision, the vision was at night. Secrecy is emphasized in the sense that man will never be made aware of this information that God's gathering on him or having it having been done to him. Man, in general, is just not going to be aware but if he were, he has no way of stopping it. 
<clears throat> the other riders of the horses report that the world is at rest, quiet and at peace, but the language indicates that the peace that they're speaking of at that time was a product of deceit, it was a product of broken promises and a false arrogant assumption that this man-made condition of security is going to be sustained by man. That's the kind of peace that they're reporting up, which is not the kind of peace that God wants. We're instructed in this vision that God will return to Jerusalem in mercy. The temple will be rebuilt and God himself will be involved in the rebuilding of the temple. That was the essence of a measuring line spoken of there. Vision two. There are four horns introduced, symbolizing the totality of military might in the world. The vision is global in nature. These horns are directly responsible for the scattering of the Jews throughout the world. That's the second vision that's given in Zechariah. The responsibility laid out for the scattering of the Jews throughout the world. Global dispersion, which happened. Then the four artisans are introduced, four craftsmen that are introduced by God himself in this vision. Unusual since an intermediary is involved with Zechariah, but God himself introduces these four. Purpose of these craftsmen is to overthrow, that is to terminate the activities of the four horns. Vision three, a man with a line is introduced and the purpose of this line is to measure Jerusalem. This measuring device is different Different terminology from that which was mentioned in the first vision. It can have a meaning to include cords of inheritance, which would include territorial apportionment of Israel with Jerusalem in its center. We have looked at some points at the territorial apportionment of Israel at the end of the age. At the very least, it defines an area that will be filled out by measured dimensions. Jerusalem is further described as a city without walls, a city that will contain a large population having material wealth. God himself will protect the expanded city with walls of fire around it, and God will be its glory within Jerusalem. The expansion of themes of the first vision is that God is responsible for the dispersion of the Jews over the face of the earth. There is a warning to the Jews that have been dispersed across the face of the earth to leave the nations of the earth. For judgment is coming to these nations. Revelation 18 will probably apply here. Then God describes Israel as the pupil of his eye, which is the part of the eye that's most precious easily injured and in need of protection. These nations that plunder Israel will themselves be plundered. That's why Israel is warned to get out of them and get back to where I want you to be as I'm collecting you. God announces that he is coming and will live among his people. Further, many nations will join themselves to Adonai. The universal recognition of God's sovereignty, the end of time, is envisioned here. And the nations slash Gentiles will be accepted by God in some cases as equivalent to Israel. The people of Israel will be God's inheritance. Israel, Israel with Jerusalem at its center is from which God's possession emerges. God will again make Jerusalem the center of his earthly abode, a place which symbolizes his sovereignty over Judah and, by extension, the entire world. There's a call for the reverence of God by all mankind. Everyone will strike a reverent, hushed pose in acknowledgement to his presence. The fourth vision is a courtroom scene. I love this one. I like to teach on it. Yehoshua, the high priest, is representing Yeshua here. Hasatan is the accuser in this courtyard. And the angel of Adonai is acting as a defense attorney. And Hasatan wants to condemn Yehoshua. Hasatan is rebuked. The filthy clothing, the sins of the people being represented in those filthy clothing, are removed from Yehoshua and he's clothed in clean garments. That is, his acquired guilt being taken away. A clean turban is placed on his head. 
All of this is beyond Yehoshua's power to provide for himself. This is a gift from Adonai. This is something that God empowered Yeshua to do and brought him home and cleaned him up. This is Adonai's grace. It's interesting that the turban is described as a crown belonging to royalty. The word used is essentially here for this turban in the Hebrew means diadem. This may be very well describing the prince introduced in Ezekiel 34:24. Yeshua, Yehoshua, is charged. If obedient, he will be in charge of judicial function, that is the court's ruling authority. He will also have direct access to God. In ancient times, access to God was through the prophets. God promises to bring his servant the branch who could, will, remove the guilt of Israel in a single day. That's what this parable form is about. When that day comes, it will be a time of harmony, social stability, close international relationships between people. Vision 5, divine resources for the high priest. Here in this vision we have a menorah, a lampstand with its bowl at its top and seven lamps, seven tubes, two olive trees, one to the right and one to the left. And Zechariah asks, what are these? But gets no answer until later. The seven lamps are defined as the eyes of Adonai that range over the entire earth. We're back to God watching over everything that's going on on earth and taking notes of it. Seven lamps are defined as the eyes of Adonai that range over the entire earth. And finally the answer is given to Zechariah's question. The two, the two olive trees are sons of oil. The two olive trees are sons of oil. Two individuals who are involved in God's presence. Oil representing the Holy Spirit. Two individuals who are involved in God's presence among his people and are close in a close relationship with God. Some people believe that this represents the two witnesses that are coming. Sixth vision is the flying scroll. Flying scroll is 30 feet long, 15 feet wide. Offenses against man are described on one side of this scroll. Other side are offenses listed against God. And the judgment or the result of these offenses is to be swept away. That's why the scroll is flying. No one will persist in disobedience. God will work out his retribution at the homes of the guilty. God's authority will go anywhere. Will go where man's judicial authority could not go. Punishment will be in the privacy of the home with the individual. No one can plead ignorance. All can see the scroll. No one is going to escape judgment. This is literally ruling with an iron staff. You know how you're going to be able to keep the nations of the earth from building war machines during the millennial period? How we're going to keep from not having mayhem and rape and all the stuff that we have now? This is probably describing the essence of the kind of discipline placed on man so as to maintain order during this period of time. And the seventh vision is the flying basket, or ephah. Zechariah sees a container used to contain a dry measure, that being about three-fifths of a U.S. bushel. It's moving. Motion is emphasized. It contains wickedness in the form of a woman, symbolic for the wickedness of the land of Israel. The woman in the ephah is associated with a female goddess, possibly the queen of the heavens. The wickedness is the opposite of righteousness. Civil and ethical matters, especially as promoted by idolatry. The ephah is being carried away by two women. It would be very sexist if it were being carried away by two men, since it contains a woman. The Bible isn't sexist, in spite of how Paul is misinterpreted. These two angels lifted the basket 
and was being transported between heaven and earth. Interesting statement in view of who is the prince of the power of the air. It was being transported in the air. Satan claims to be prince of the power of the air. It is transported to the country of Shinar, which is Babylon. Believed to be modern Iraq, about 150 miles south of Baghdad. There is a house uh, or shrine that will be built for this ephah and it will be set down on that shrine. This wickedness is removed from Israel to the land of Shamar to an area set aside for it. The wickedness is going to be removed from Israel and taken to Babylon. Vision 8 is of the four chariots coming from between the two mountains of bronze. First chariot has red horses, second has black, the third white, and the fourth spotted or dappled horses. It's believed that these horses specifically, or symbolically, speak to all of the four points of the compass. The fourth horse, the dappled horse, denotes a pattern rather than a color. All the horses are mighty ones. The chariots and horse groups are further described as the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, symbolic of God's omnipresence. These all come from being stationed in God's presence to patrol the earth at the end of the age. The black horses go north with the white horses after them. Some people think that there are two powers there to be overcome. The dappled horses go south. That's the only two directions that are mentioned here. Some translations, though, and ignore this if you find it, some trans translations have other horses going west. It's not in the original. But nothing in the text indicates this going west. The red horses go through all the earth. The horse groups that went north, the thought there is of the earthly powers controlling Judah at that time. This gives God's spirit rest, which could mean there was victory over the north country and nothing else stands in the way of God's salvation. Now that's a quick review and it wasn't intended to teach. If anybody's hearing this for the first time, please understand that this was a quick review to jog people's memories, help jog the memory not intended to teach this portion of Zechariah. We took about six hours plus to really lay out everything that we just ran over real quickly. What we really need to do, as this may have shown you, is to review our notes on these eight visions thoroughly because Zechariah is an important base for understanding Revelation. Everything's on tape for those that haven't heard the full teaching. So this concludes our teaching on Zechariah. Next week we will start the Olivet Discourses of Yeshua, largely in Matthew 24. And we're going to take about six weeks to get through that chapter because it is an absolute necessity to understand what Yeshua himself told his disciples that it's going to be like when he comes back, which is what the book of Revelation is all about discussing. We'll close with that.